So it is my pleasure to join you all. So I'm Jennifer Kojal. I'm originally from Oklahoma. I went to vet school, did my undergrad and went to vet school at Oklahoma State and joined the faculty at Texas Tech School of Medicine in 2021. And so I put these pictures up. Um, a picture on the right grew up in a ranching family in Oklahoma. So home for me is south of Tulsa. Um, we actually live in the Creek Nation. And then we also have a ranch um, in southeast Kansas. And so you can kind of see the difference in Oklahoma. We run mainly cow-calf. Um, Kansas is cow-calf, but we have a big part of our operation as stalkers. So the cattle industry is pretty near and dear to my heart. So what we're going to do today, so we're going to walk through a complete breeding soundness exam of bulls. We're going to talk about the value of breeding soundness, breeding soundness exams, and then we'll discuss trick a little bit. So why do we do breeding soundness exams? Why do we as veterinarians, as producers, why do we want to perform breeding soundness exams? And so if we think about the bulls, we can really put them into three populations. There's going to be a population of fertile bulls that are going to get their complement of cows pregnant. There's going to be that population of subfertile bulls that are going to be able to get some pregnancies, but not the number that they should. And then there's a population of sterile bulls. So the population of absolutely sterile bulls in the world is very small. But the population of subfertile bulls is quite large, bigger than we want. And that's really what the breeding soundness exam targets is finding those subfertile bulls. So when we think about breeding soundness exams, we should be testing every bull every year. And so I really advocate for our producers to have breeding soundness exams done 30 to 60 days prior to breeding season. And so why is that? Why do I say that number? There is nothing magic about that number. But if we do find an abnormality, we either have time to address that abnormality. So if we find a lameness, we have time to address that lameness. Or if that bull is subfertile, you as a producer have time to go out and find a replacement before the start of the breeding season. So really it's an insurance policy. Breeding soundness exams are not good for life. And so uh, oftentimes when we buy bulls out of the, a sale, they come with a breeding soundness exam. And we should really be repeating those breeding soundness exams before every season that that bull goes out. So if he's going out for a spring or summer, he needs to be checked before then, or if he's going out for a fall season, really needs to be checked. So at least every year and ideally before every breeding season, if he's being used for multiple seasons. And then breeding soundness exams are an, a great time to test for venereal diseases. So we already have the bulls up, they're in the pens. Um, oftentimes they have been off loafing in pastures um, and they could have commingled with cows and could be positive for tricks. So that's a great time before the start of the breeding season to make sure that our bulls are clean and ready to go to work. So when we think about a breeding soundness exam, we kind of cate can categorize it into four main areas. And so physical exam, scrotal circumference, and then evaluation of the semen, which includes sperm motility and sperm morphology. And we'll go through each of these in depth, but each of these four areas really come together to give us the whole picture. So one is not more important than the other. They're all of equal uh, value, if you will. Um, and, but they each tell us a different story about that bull. So breathing soundness exams and having this, a successful day of performing breeding soundness exams really starts for me when those bulls are coming to the pens. We want those bulls to really be handled pretty quietly and gently. Uh, those bulls that are pretty stirred up when they hit the chute are often harder to collect. 
Um, and we often don't get as good as samples. We like when those bulls come in quietly, slowly. It also gives us the veterinarians a, a chance to watch for lamenesses. So if they're just walking, we can pick up any lamenesses that might uh, that bull might have and really gives us a chance to evaluate those bulls in a calm setting. Not to mention they're not trying to tear down their pins. So physical exams. So we're going to look at foot and leg structure. And these are really paramount for us. So especially when we think about where your bulls are out, that terrain is really rough. And those bulls are really having to get out and cover a lot of land. So if we have a bull like this picture on the left that's extremely straight through his hawk and pastern, that bull is not going to have the longevity that we want in a herd, right? We're going to pay quite a bit of money for a bull that's has a high likelihood of becoming lame. So really paying attention to that foot and leg structure. I'm trying to advance with the wrong keys. Other confirmation we want to look at, we can look at the front legs and make sure that they're not buffed over or they don't toe in, they're not pigeon toed or bow legged. We want to make sure that they're not from the back legs, they're not post legged or sickle hopped, right? And so really making sure that our bulls have that correct confirmation for the fact that it's going to be the ability of that the, those bulls to walk, cover that ground, find those females in heat, and breed those females, right? We think that about it when a bull breeds a female, there's a lot of weight on those back legs. And so back leg structure is really important to make sure that we have bulls that don't end up lame. So I, with a lot of my producers, I like to implement this. So the American Angus Association came out with a foot score guideline and a structure guideline. And I really like this. It doesn't matter what breed you're using, you can um, implement this into your herd and help it to make you make selection decisions. And so you can find this on the American Angus Association. You can print it off. Uh, laminate it, um, make tons of copies so that they get lost at the pins or the barn. It's no big deal. Um, but you can easily find this. And I think it's a great tool to start identifying those animals that have the foot and leg structure that we really want. So this just gives you the back of the sheet. It's a two-sided um, pamphlet. And so this kind of gives you a more detailed look at what foot angle and claw set is ideal and how to grade your animals. So kind of moving along. So the other, another thing that we're going to look at is body condition scores. We really want, if we talk about bulls being evaluated on a nine point scale, which is the most common scale that we use for our beef animals, we really want our bulls to be at a six to seven breeding condition or body condition score free breeding. And so it's kind of a goldie kind of, I think about it as a Goldilocks. We want them um, just right, not too fat, not too thin. Too fat bulls are just going to want to go sit in the shade and not work. Too thin bulls, they're really needing nutrients. And so we want to think about our bulls going into the pastures, at going in, starting the breeding season, it's body condition six to seven, because they're probably going to be a hardworking bull is going to lose approximately one to two body condition during the breeding season. And so if we think about, well, Jennifer, which bulls are going to lose what, how many body conditions, our older bulls will tend to maintain their body condition score a little easier than our young bulls. So our two and three year old bulls, they're really apt to lose those at least at a minimum of two body condition scores. So really making sure if they started at six, that when at the end of the breeding season, they're going to probably be at a four and we really don't want them any thinner than that. So we'll often make sure that we look at an individual ID. So you'll often notice that we write an individual ID when we write out our breeding census exams. And that way, you know what results go to what animal. Um, if the owners request it, we can age them. I won't tell you that I mug every bull and look at their teeth. 
But oftentimes when we get to our mature bulls, we will take a look in their mouth and just make sure that they're not popcorn mouth, right? That they haven't lost a lot of their teeth and they still have good dentition and are able to go out and graze and get the nutrients that they require. We'll also make sure that they don't have wooden tongue or lumpy jaws. So conditions that would impede their ability to go out and eat adequate nutrition. We'll also look at eyes. Eyes are super important for a bull that he has two functional eyes. And so why do I think about eyes? Most people say, well, eyes aren't really important for him to breed. But if we think about how a bull identifies females to go breed, it's because he sees them riding other cows or other cows riding those females. That is his cue to go over there and check and see which of those females are in heat and then breed them. So if they have big scars, um, if they have cancer eye or something of that, that's something that we need to address and think about. So there's an ugly cancer eye and our good old Herefords, right? So physical exam. So feet and legs, you notice I harp on feet and legs a lot. And that's because they're just really the engine of that bull. Uh, we're going to look at claws. So making sure cracks, any abnormal wear. So this top picture is this bull has really bad cracks. We really need to address that. If this bull is not already lame, he's going to be lame. Uh, this bull has screw claw. Now, here's the thing about screw claw. So we see screw claw in the hind feet in the outside claw. And so this outside claw is really coming over this inside claw. This is a heritable condition that we can see in bulls and cows. And so if we find this condition in a bull, we'll often trim their feet. And then we'll have a discussion about this bull should you really be used for a terminal sire only. Because this condition is heritable, although it has a small heritability, females and sons from that bull can have this condition. And really it's a costly disease, right? This bull is either going lame or cow is going lame and we have to trim their feet or we have to trim their feet in maintenance to keep them lameness free. So those are things that we really want to watch for. And we really, um, I like to have discussions. So I talk about everything as a discussion and every, but everything is a choice. Uh, the next thing that we often look for, one of the big things are interdigital fibromas or corns. So this is a big corn. And the thing about corns and bull's feet is they're not a problem until they become a problem right? It's kind of like having a big blister between our toes. When it gets to the point that we become lame, that's a problem. So we really want to adjust that we can surgically remove those corn uh, before the breeding season. So that's something that we want because we don't want a bull to become lame in the middle of the season. That's really bad. So kind of moving on. So kind of now, if you will, we have the bull in the chute. So we've watched him come to the chute. We've looked at his feet. We've looked at his legs. Um, and we're going to get that bull in the chute. And so one of the first things after I look at the eyes, look at the head, I go to kind of the back end of the bull and start my reproductive exam there. So the first thing we want to do is make sure the sheath is freely movable and free of swelling. Because you can see in this char label down here, all the swelling in the sheath. This bull has had an injury and is unlikely to be a satisfactory potential breeder for this upcoming season. And so that is a conversation that we will have of does that bull get called because you don't want to put any money into it or that bull needs to have sexual rest until we can recheck him and see if he'll be a satisfactory potential breeder in the future. So once we check the sheath, we go to a scrotal exam, and we're really going to look for shape and symmetry. We really want the testicles to be very symmetrical. Um, there shouldn't be greater than 10% difference between the right and left testicle. If you see a big swelling in the scrotum, like this uh, young bull calf here, 
that can be a sign that there is something wrong. And so this bull actually had an ingual hernia. And so his intestines were down amongst his testicles, which is not good. Uh, we'll look for dermatitis and frostbite. If a bull has excessive frostbite to his scrotum, he may not be able to contract his testicles near his body or let them down during periods of hot weather. So why is that important if we have excess frostbite? Um, and it's because in the bull, they, the testicles need to be about five to seven degrees cooler than body temperature to work properly. I talk about the testicles being like a factory. And so that factory really needs ideal working conditions. And one of those ideal working conditions is that there is testosterone freely available and that there is, it is appropriate temperature. That's really what the testicles require to work at an optimum function. We'll look for any scars. Uh, we talked about the swelling, and we can also look for any edema within the scrotum, which can all be suggestions that something is wrong. Um, in the picture on the left, it's just a picture of frostbite. This bull has had pretty severe frostbite to the bottom part of his scrotum. Um, in this picture on the right side, you can see that this right testicle is much larger than the left. And so when we see that, we need to think about why that one testicle is much bigger than the other. Has one testicle gone, had damage to it? Is one testicle shrinking? Uh, what is really up with that? Why is there such an abnormality? So once we've done our scrotal exam, and so our scrotal exam, really, we think about looking at the scrotum itself and also palpating the testicles, looking for any changes. The next thing we're going to do is scrotal circumference. And scrotal circumference will use a tape measure of some sort and will go around the widest part of the testicles. And so why is scrotal circumference important? So if we think about it, scrotal circumference really tells us the testicular width and testicular width is highly correlated to how what the daily sperm production is going to be for a bull. And so why do we why do we worry about what the daily sperm production is for that bull? And that's because we want it adequate for him to be able to go out and breed a number of females that are on in heat on any given day. So if there is five females in heat in the herd, he should have adequate scrotal circumference to be able to, br to breed that. So scrotal circumference, if we think about scrotal circumference, lifetime potential testy size is really determined before weaning. So if we're thinking about when is a really critical time in that bull's life, it's really while he's still suckling his mom. And so thinking about that, if we're raising our own bulls um, and keeping those for our herds, we want to make sure that those bulls are coming from excellent mothers. So their nutritional level really needs to be pretty high as nutritional levels in the post weaning period really have no effect on testy size of yearling or older bulls. So if we're wanting to select larger testicle bulls, we really need to focus on that pre-weaning period. So in this chart, I show you what the standards are for age of bulls. So our, our bulls that are 15 months or less, they need a minimum of 30 centimeter scrotal circumference. For bulls that are two years old or older, we need to be at 34. So also things that we need to think about in scrotal circumference. So why do we have those cutoffs? So we really talked about the bigger factory equals more product and be able to breed all the females that are in heat and get successful pregnancies on any given day. But scrotal circumference is very heritable and is linked to onset of puberty and daughters. So bulls that have larger scrotal circumferences, their daughters will reach puberty at a younger age. So next thing we'll do once we have scrotal circumference is we'll start our internal exam. 
So we're going to palpate the accessory glands and we're going to also start stimulating that bowl for electro ejaculation. And we're going to really focus and make sure that we don't have any disease in accessory sex glands. It is not uncommon for in young bulls for us to find vesiculitis. Um, so that's going to be an infection in the vesicular glands. And often what we will see is there's going to be an abundance of pus and bacteria in those vesicular glands, which is really not compatible with making a successful pregnancy. So it is common in young bulls housed together, um, and often these bulls are on high grain diets. We diagnose bulls with vesiculitis usually on palpation, and we can see white blood cells in the ejaculate once we um, look under the microscope. And those bulls may or may not have pain upon palpation, but it's going to be important for us to treat those bulls with systemic antibiotics. So mycotil, draxin, um, antibiotics of that nature are really good for treating, treating vesiculitis. So next we go to our semen collection method. So the most common way that we collect semen and our range bowls is by electroejaculation. So we're going to put this probe into the anus. Um, we often have a box looking similar to this. Uh, different brands have a slightly different look and there's two or three different brands on the market. Um, and we're going to use that to stimulate those accessory sex glands and collect a semen sample. Also during that time, the bull is going to extend his penis and prepuce. And it's really important that we as veterinarians look at the entirety of the penis and prepuce because we can find quite a few abnormalities that can be really uh, detrimental to the breeding ability of those bulls. So things we can find, we can find hair rings. So these are just going to be rings of hair. Usually we see these in young bulls. Um, and usually it's because they're riding one another. Warts, we can see um, prepucial or penile warts like this one, um, they bleed quite copiously when they are traumatized. And so we really need to um, remove those. Those are often um, small surgical procedures that we can do in the field. And young bulls down here in this picture in the bottom right, we can see a persistent frenulum. Those are conditions that we can see in young bulls as well. Um, infectious um, or Pustular blanopostitis caused by IBR uh, are tiny little pinpoint traumas. And so that we can actually see, it, which is very painful for the bull. And so that bull is probably not going to breed and needs um, to be sexually arrested. And then we can other, find other traumas or injuries to the penis and prepuce. So if we think about... Um, veterinarians as we do brooding soundness exams, we really try to our very hardest to be equal opportunity evaluators. So oftentimes it's thought that um, somebody passes us a hundred underneath the table uh, when we say a bull is not bad. And really that's not um, the what we're trying to do. We are really trying to find those subfertile bulls. So when we tell you a bull is unsatisfactory, um, it's we're trying to do good for the herd. And so that's oftentimes the common misconception that we have. Um, we don't fail bulls as veterinarians, they fail themselves. And so our goal as veterinarians is to find those subfertile or infertile bulls to protect your calf crops because we want you to be successful because if you're not there, we're not there. So kind of going on, so uh, once we've collected semen, we're going to look at progressive motility. So those sperm cells must travel to the uterine tubes to fertilize the oocyte. So we're going to look at the percentage of sperm moving in the forward direction in high-powered fields. So you might notice when we do breeding soundness exams that the progressive motility, the bull has to have a minimum of 30% progressive motility. And so you might say that's really low, um, but what we're trying to do is days like yesterday, pretty much all week, uh, where it's been below freezing and the wind's blowing like crazy, 
um, that steam is really going to cool down once we collect it. And so when the semen cools down, it doesn't move as fast. So we're really helping uh, not penalizing the bull for adverse environmental conditions. The next thing you'll do is you'll often see, you'll see us stain the semen and you'll see us look at the head, mid piece and tail of a hundred sperm. So we're going to look at this. And so it's what we see under a microscope is going to be, these are snapshots that I've taken from a microscope. And we're really looking for abnormal. So uh, this sperm is going to be a normal, but you can see if we compare head shapes between these two sperm, this one is very, I call it balloon shaped or pear shaped. And so this is an abnormal head won't end up making a pregnancy. And so what we're looking for is we want 70% normal for morphology. If you look at the literature, and so we have data from thousands of bulls um, across the United States. And if you look at the most common reason that a bull fails a breeding soundness exam, it's because of poor sperm morphology. Sperm morphology, if you think about it, we can kind of break it down and say the head of the sperm contains all the DNA that's going to match with the oocyte to make our calf. The mid piece is really the powerhouse of our cell. That's where all the energy is going to come from, from that sperm to make it to the oocyte to fertilize. And the tail is really the rotor um, and the driving device. So we're looking for any abnormalities. Um, so we talked a little bit about this slide. So like I said, sperm morphology is the most common reason that a bull doesn't pass a breeding soundness exam. And abnormal cells are often unable to fertilize the egg or successfully create an embryo. And so that's really what we're trying to prevent. We want bulls with really good sperm that are going to create a, a successful embryo and that will become a calf for you. So you will often talk about three classifications. So we'll have satisfactory potential breeders. So those bulls are going to be able to go out and successfully impregnate 25 to 30 cows in a 60 day period. Uh, we will sometimes use the deferred category. So this is going to be utilized when the veterinarian is reasonably sure that a bull will be able to recover from a condition that precludes him from passing. So when my, I use the deferred, so if that bull is lame and I think it's, we have a reasonable shot at making him sound again, if the bull is too young or if the bull has poor sperm morphology, secondary to heat or stress, heat or stress are really detrimental to those factories that we talked about before. And then unsatisfactory potential breeders. So those are bulls that don't meet the qualifications and discussion of calling from the herd has likely taken place. So what is not evaluated by breeding soundness exams? So libido and ability to make intromission with the cow are the two things that your veterinarian doesn't check. So, and when we talk about libido, how willing is that bull to go out and work? And when he finds a female in heat, is he able to successfully mount and breed her? Those are the two things we don't check, um, but we hope that all of our producers, when at the beginning of the breeding season, um, witness. So there's a lot of things that can go into looking at it, uh, libido. And so um, really no valid, practical, or repeatable method of libido evaluation and realizing that we have great breed variations. So um, in New Mexico, we don't have a lot of Brahmin or Brahmin influenced cattle and we probably do in the Southwest, but Throughout, we have really our um, Angus, Hereford, those types of cattle, but our Brahmin influenced cattle really don't like to breed during uh, daylight hours. They often breed most heavily at night, and so they're really hard to watch for breed variations. There's going to be a influence, social influence, so young bulls, 
um, that are out with older bulls are often shyer to breed. And then mature bulls are often more willing to breed than older bulls. So thinking about what is the value of a breeding soundness exam to you as a producer? So um, ran, we could ran this cost analysis sheet. And so move my little box so I can see. Um, and so if we think the top box, and so I based this on a 25 head cattle herd. And so why did I pick that number? It's really small compared to the average cattle herd in New Mexico. But if we think about it, that's across the U.S., that is the average cow herd number. And so that's why we chose that. And so you can extrapolate from there. So total cost per bull. So this is all the range of prices that the veterinarian might charge. It tells you the total cost per female exposed to that bull. We see the change in income. So it's even across the board. But what is really nice to see is this benefit cost to ratio. So what this tells you is for every dollar spent for BSC, you re get in return eight, somewhere between six to eight dollars, depending on what the breeding soundness exam. So I think that's a pretty good return on investment for performing a breeding soundness exam. And is one of the big reasons that I think breeding soundness exams are really important for my producers to do every year. So we talked about test, we can kind of talk about test matings a little bit. Uh, test matings are one way to test libido. So we're going to have uh, females in heat. And so your veterinarian might recommend a test mating if you tell them that you have a bull that you don't think is working. And so we're going to have peanut, we're going to have bulls in heat, and we're really going to look at for any penile abnormalities or reasons that that bull won't mount that cow or is an unable to make intermission. All right. So we're going to switch over to try trichomonas fetus um, and what we need to know to protect our herds. So when we think about the bull, uh, it is an obligate parasite of the bovine reproductive tract. And so its parasite only lives on the penis and prepuce of the bull and into the distal urethra. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, depends how you look at it, our bulls are asymptomatic carriers. They don't tell us when they have the, the, have the disease and we see no outward signs. So it doesn't affect our, the ability of the bull to breed. Uh, but it will affect the number of calves that he sires. So it really doesn't invade the epithelium of the penis and prepuce. It sits right on the surface of the penis and prepuce. And the, really that works in the parasite's advantage because when the bull breeds the cow, the parasite is sloughed off into the vagina of the cow and that's how she becomes infected. And so we don't see any penile or prepucial lesions, and it doesn't affect the libido of the bull. He's just going to keep on breeding cows just like normal. Oh. oh, there we go. So what happens in our females? So after coitus, they're going to become, so we talked about they become infected by mechanical transmission of that organism from the penis and prepuce to the vagina. I just can't move my box out of the way. Here we go. Maybe we'll try that side. And that organism is going to traverse. So it is a modal organism. So it's going to go from the vagina up the cervix and colonize the entire reproductive tract. It can be isolated from the reproductive tract as the early for as early as four days post-infection. And what happens is this female, she may reckon, her body may recognize that she's pregnant. Um, and so she doesn't return the heat, but that embryo is likely to perish. And so we'll see what we call a regular returns to estrus. So if we think about the estrus cycle in cows is 21 days. So in a normal a pattern, a cow would come in at 21, 42, 63 days 
in breeding season. And so what will happen in one of our earliest signs that we might have trick in a herd is that we see these cows in the heat at abnormal times. We know that when she was in heat and bred the first time, and then we see her come into heat at 47 days, which it would be abnormal. And so that's often one of our first signs um, that we have may have a trick problem. We can also have pyometras, which is just pus filled uterus. Uh, maybe something that your veterinarian finds on their, especially when they're palpating for pregnancies. And then you may see abortions. So we talked about immunity. So a good thing about this disease is that the cow can an immune response to T fetus. So what will happen, normal progression, as a cow becomes infected, she loses the embryo or she aborts the calf, depending on how long she carries that pregnancy. And then her body says, oh, I will mount an immune response. And so she can become pregnant after that and carry a calf to term with no problem. The unfortunate thing about tritrichomonas fetus is that the cow has a very limited immune response and in, in that it doesn't last for very long. So often she's susceptible to the disease again in the next breeding season. And we will have a few cows that will never clear the infection. They become what we call persistently infected. So what are things in our cow herds that raise suspicions? So if we see a vaginal discharge from a cow, we see cows returning to estrus at a regular rate. We have an increase in open rate. Our veterinarian is finding postcoital pyometra. So they're finding pyometras at the time of pregnancy check. And then we have strung out calving seasons. So if we're having majority of our calves at the end of our calving season instead of the beginning, that is maybe an issue that we are looking at. So what are our herd level impacts? Our percent of non-pregnant cows increases substantially. We're gonna have a prolonged calving interval. So we're probably not going to have calves of similar age are going to be really spread out. And we can have those calving intervals can be of 90 days or longer. So what can we do? So we're really going to evaluate the risk of our cattle herd. So knowing the prevalence of trick in your area. And so New Mexico has done a great job of looking at the county by county prevalence and making that known to you all. So you all know when you have trick endemic in your area and help that really helps you to think about your risk evaluation and knowing the actions of the operation. So how are you buying cows? How are you buying bulls and biosecurity? And so we'll go through each of these. So risk factors. So what are some things that might make you a high risk herd? So the odds of being a positive herd, if your neighbors have a positive herd is 18.3 times more likely than if you have neighbors that are negative, right? Bulls like to go across fences. Herds that reported greater than one week of elapsed time to fix broken fences were 4.3 times more likely. And we realize that in big, rugged country, it takes it might take a while to find those big, big fences. And so really, this was in big range country that this was reported. Odds of being a positive herd of grazing on public land compared to private land was 2.9 times higher. And then herds commingling with 14 or more herds are at higher risk. So if we think about high risk uninfected herds, what do we need to do? So we're going to take management strategies for low risk herds. So good biosecurity, we're going to test our bulls every year. We're going to buy, if we're buying cows, we're going to buy pregnant cows. Um, we're going to strategically graze to minimize neighbor contact. So what do I mean by that? So I'm going to graze my heavy pregnant cows near neighbors 
that might have a roaming bull because that bull is very unlikely to come over to my herd of pregnant cows. Probably not going to put my cycling cows right next to a fence that neighbors uh, another herd, if at all possible. I'll try to use my more interior pastures for that. We're going to maintain a young bull battery. Uh, there is some thought that young bulls are less likely to be infected with trick compared to the older bulls. And this likely has to do with opportunity to get the disease. If we have an unplanned co-mingling, so if we find a bull in our pasture that's not ours, we're going to isolate and test that bull, which is a nice rule that New Mexico has. We're going to restrict our breeding season. So we're going to only have a 60 or 90 day breeding season so that we really know if we have any outliers. And we're going to institute a surveillance testing. So what is institute surveillance testing? And that's what we've been talking about really all along is that we're checking our bulls to see if the time of breeding stand on this exam, if we have any positive bulls. So lots of talk about the T fetus vaccine. And so the vaccine is a pretty good vaccine, but we really know, need to know the limits of that vaccine. So the vaccine was developed to help reduce clinical signs, not prevent clinical signs. So if we think about it, if we look at the studies that were done, the vaccine trials that were done, 66% of vaccinated heifers were pregnant. 28% of unvaccinated heifers were pregnant following infection. So they took 20 heifers and they split, they took 40 heifers, excuse me, and did 20 in the treatment, 20 in the control, and they all, inoc and they inoculated half of those um, with the vaccine, didn't inoculate the other half, and, but they put T fetus in the vagina of each of those. And so they really looked at the pregnancy rates. And so you can see that the controls had a much higher percentage of embryonic and fetal loss. So the vaccine will help you keep some pregnancies, but you will still have some pregnancy loss with the vaccine, but it's better than nothing. So for infected herds, what are we gonna do? We're gonna sample and test all herd bulls. Um, we're gonna call all of our positive bulls. Any cows that are found to be open, we're going to call those. Um, those that are not pregnant at the end of the breeding season or those that fail to deliver a calf. If we don't want to call a large number of our cows, we can develop two management groups. And so, that, but it's very hard to keep those two management groups completely separate. And we're going to consider vaccinating all of our cows. So managing the risk, what are we going to do? We're going to do our very best to reduce the risk. We're going to formulate a good biosecurity plan to pick up those bulls that are roaming over across our pastures about whether vaccines make sense in our herds, things of that nature. And if we have more questions about formulating a herd specific plan, you can go to this website, trickconsult.org, and it will help you put together that herd plan um, specifically to meet the management needs of your herd. So with that, I will um, happy to ask, answer any questions or talk about anything else that comes to mind. I'm gonna stop sharing. If you guys have any questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself or better yet, you can go ahead and insert them in the chat box. Let me share. Seems like you pretty much answered everybody's question. <laughs> okay, let's see. If you guys have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or insert them in the chat box. Um, so I have one question with many being from very rural and having smaller operations, what are the chances of finding a veterinarian? And so that's really going to depend on where you are. Um, 
working with, um, I know that Dr. Wenzel and with the, which is the extension veterinarian, um, he can be very helpful in identifying a veterinarian in your area. Um, and they're starting to become more practitioners that are really just focusing on the rural communities and will um, look and, and are willing to help you all um, that have smaller herds and are in rural communities. So those are a couple good, Dr. Wenzel would be a really great resource and he's the New Mexico um, And he's the New Mexico Extension Veterinarian, so he should be a good resource for you all. If you have any more questions, feel free to unmute yourself. I did send out a poll um, slash survey um, to you guys all. If you guys could just take a minute to fill that survey out just rating the understanding of you guys' understanding before and after this presentation um, as well if you have any additional comments to what you would like to see um, from us give a presentation feel free to put that in the comment section um, but and as well as like do you plan to implement this information provided on your operation as well so take a minute to complete that if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself, like I mentioned, or you can just insert them in the chat box. Jennifer, this is Marge Lantana. Thank you for your inf uh, very valuable information on uh, Solanus, um, both Solanus presentation. I have um, a question on the, the, the testing for sperm, mm -hmm. uh, both sperm. Are there uh -huh. other um, abnormals, like such as um, two-headed um, sperm? On Ab yep, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't really go through the sperm abnormalities, but there's probably, oh, there's probably 35 different sperm, roughly 35. I'd have to go through and count the whole list. Um, but there's roughly about 35 sperm abnormalities that we're looking for. So we're looking for all sorts of two-headed sperm, sperm that have holes in the heads, um, sperm that are abnormally shaped, um, sperm with the little droplets on it, um, sperm with bent tails, um, all kinds of different abnormalities that we're looking for. And so lots of different abnormalities that we're looking for um, and lots of variations of abnormal that we're looking for when we're looking underneath the microscope. I see. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, well, if there are no other questions um, that will conclude our presentation for tonight, I just wanna give a big thank you to Jennifer for providing this presentation on full soundness exam and trick testing, a lot of information that you've given us tonight. So I really appreciate you um, taking some time out of your schedule and your evening schedule to give us this presentation for our producers. So much appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you for so much for the invite. Let me know if I can answer any questions for anybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, if you guys have any, um, okay, I'm not sure if that was, you have a question in the chat box or if it was a comment. Okay. Um, look, so when looking at hoof health, there are some major concerns of cracking and correlation to nutrition. Absolutely. And there, a lot of those correlations can go to minerals. And so knowing what minerals are deficient for your specific pastures will be very helpful in thinking about how you supplement mineral. Um, so yes, but yes, very, that's a very keen observation, observation. that 
yes, hoof health does go a lot back to minerals and knowing what minerals are naturally deficient in your pastures. Thank you, Laura, for that question. And thank you to everyone that um, said thank you for this presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to our announcements. Um, just to let you guys know that we have another webinar next week. This one's alternating um, to our hoop house. So if you are interested in starting up a hoop house, just something that's really personal to you and just wanna start from scratch, um, we have a mini hoop house startup webinar next week on February 8th, which is on a Wednesday. Um, starting at 5.30, like all of our webinars, and this will be presented by our Janae College Extension agent, Daryl Yazi. So he'll be providing this information. And if you guys have any questions that may be coming to your mind later on today or tomorrow, um, this webinar are, is being recorded. So it will be posted next week um, for you guys' information. And if you guys have any questions for Dr. Jennifer, um, feel free to email us and we'll get in contact with her to see if she can answer you guys' questions. Um, but thank you everyone for uh, being here with us this evening. And just to let you guys know, we do have our website up there. So I get a lot of comments that um, where we can view our website if there we have any upcoming events. So just to run with you guys, run it through with you guys. Here's our website. So you simply just type in nsa.nmsu.edu. Right when you log in, it'll just pop right up. Our homepage gives you guys a quick introduction to who we are, our goals. We even have a Facebook page. So you'll be caught up to every week of a new event. So if that's something you guys are um, interested in, um, give us a follow. We do have, let me see, and this is out of my way. Okay, so here's our kind of tab section. So here's meet the team. We have a current project, the Native American Producer Success Project. We do have a conservation plan program. So if you guys are interested in um, where to, unsure where to start in your conservation plan, um, NS, NSA project and the NA College Land Grant Office are collaborating and delivering conservation planning assistance as well as conservation planning workshop for Eastern and Northern agencies. So if you guys want to get a copy of a farm and ranch conservation plan templates, here they are. And we also have a guide for each ranch and farm um, template conservation plan. So if that's something that is interested in you guys, feel free, there are um, templates here for you guys to download. We also have upcoming events. Um, like for today, we have the bull breeding sound, soundness exam and trick testing. Next week, we have that mini hoop house startup. Then the following week, we have the sheep and goat vaccination and herd health management. I know a lot of you guys have sheep and goats, so Here's a here's an interesting webinar for you guys that's going to be offered by the state veterinarian. Um, tree pruning basics and just keep going, bull selection, landscaping, um, vegetable gardening, and so forth. So a lot of um, great webinars that are going to be popping up in some workshops that we're working on too for in person. So keep a lookout for that. And if you guys want to. Um, um, continue on in um, looking at the, the PDFs and PowerPoints of all these presentations. You're more than welcome to webinars and workshops. All of our recorded sessions are heading to our YouTube page. So if this um, bull um, sound, soundness exam, um, trick testing webinar, if you miss something from it, it's going to be recorded, it's all recorded, and it's you just head over to our YouTube channel. But that's just to give you guys an overview of our website. I know a lot of you wanted to know what's, um, what's there and what we offer. 
everything that we've mentioned is all on this website. Um, USDA programs and this, as well as on here too. So take a look at it. Like I said, it's nsa.nmsu.edu. Um, it's pretty short and simple. So other than that, thank you all for joining us this evening and hope you guys have a good rest of your night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. The Navajo Sustainable Agriculture Project, we are funded by USDA Outreach and Assistance for Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers and Veteran Farmers and Ranchers Program. In short, it's pretty long. It's called the OASDVFR, and um, it's better yet to just say the whole thing. Um, but we are, um, we provide workshops and webinars and with one of our major um, project partners, and that would be Diné College Land Grant Office and COPE, which some of you guys may have known. Um, they stand for Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment. So those are two of our main project partners. The goals of the NSA project are to improve the operations, profitability, and sustainability of our far farmers and ranchers um, programs and um, their production. Increase our producers knowledge and the use of USDA programs. Some of you are main, mainly familiar with these programs from NRCS, FSA, RD and RMA programs and services and others, the resource providers from um, Navajo Nation Department of Agriculture and their AIF funding and so forth. Um, as well as increasing the local production and consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables and healthy foods by Navajo families and individuals through our gardening programs. So the way we accomplish these goals is that the NSA project is committed to providing our producers with ag workshops that we host um, with our project partners. And you guys may have noticed all of this upcoming events of in-person of us getting back out there. So we are slowly getting um, Getting out there since the um, mask requirement has been lifted. So we're slowly coming back into in-person. Then um, for right now, we are hosting weekly webinars, alternating them from livestock um, topics down to crop and farming and gardening and so forth. So uh, we also provide some ag resource, um, I, demonstrations that we're going to be uh, coming out this year as well for the livestock per se training. So that's going to be coming out as well. So for those of you that were, wouldn't, wasn't able to come on board for that for last year, we are going to be coming out with one this year. Um, but without further ado, I'll go ahead and transfer the floor over to um, Jennifer. She'll go ahead and give you guys a quick introduction and we'll start off the presentation from there. And uh, another note is that if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box, um, but we'll go ahead and hold those questions off till the very end of the presentations. But um, let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen.